The word ascedia comes from a Greek word for a state of apathy or boredom with no motive to do anything. Ascedia comes from within. It is not something imposed on us. So it is not the kind of boredom you feel when you have an interminable wait in the doctor's office with nothing to do but to read old health magazines. It is the lack of motivation to do much of anything. These days, we would suspect that a person in a chronic state of acedia is suffering from depression, and we would consider it an affliction rather than a vice. I think that there are ways to recognize depression, but acedia is harder to recognize because it can be masked by relentless activity. A person in a state of acedia might lie around the house doing nothing, or instead, she might be restless and fill up the day with meaningless busyness. The main feature of acedia is not engaging in anything that gives us a sense of purpose. Aristotle thought that there is a virtue of proper ambition. This is not quite the virtue opposed to acedia, but it is a good place to begin. When Aristotle mentions this virtue, he says it has to do with how much a man desires honors. Some people desire honors more than they should, and they are ambitious in a negative sense. And some desire honors less than they should. They are unambitious, where that also has a negative connotation. Aristotle then goes on to say that the mean between the extremes has no name, because both ambitious and unambitious are names for the vices. I'm not sure if we have a word in English that means properly ambitious. But if so, I don't think it has much to do with desiring honors. I would think that a person who doesn't care about honors, but gets up early each morning to work in her garden is properly ambitious. The key element in proper ambition is caring about things. When we care, we get a direction. When we have a direction, we can get going, not just to fill up the hours of the day, but to do something fulfilling. How can we acquire the virtue opposed to acedia? I think this is a hard question to answer because proper ambition or diligence or engagement or whatever this virtue is called does not seem to be acquired the way the other virtues are acquired by practice and habituation. Aristotle thought that we learn virtue by repeating virtuous acts. Generally, we begin practice in virtue by doing what our parents tell us to do. Share your toys, don't hit your little sister, and so on. Eventually, virtuous acts become a habit, and after a while, they become easy to do and even pleasant. A person who finds it pleasant to share her possessions has the virtue of liberality. That makes sense. But how can we learn the virtue opposed to acedia by habituation? Can we learn to care about things by repeating some pattern of behavior until it becomes a habit? I doubt it, although that does not mean that proper ambition cannot be learned. I know of research by William Damon, author of The Path to Purpose, who started the Stanford Center on Adolescence to study how adolescents find purpose. Damon's recent studies include the place of certain virtues, such as truthfulness, humility, and faith, in the development of purposeful lives. You can find a link to that work on our course website. My own view is that finding purpose may come to you all at once, or it may take a search. But finding purpose is only the first step. Unfortunately, it will probably take discipline and perseverance and courage, and maybe hope, to get through the rough spots in reaching your goals. The virtue opposed to acedia sometimes called sloth, needs the support of a lot of other virtues. Wendy Wasserstein wrote a funny book on sloth as a parody of self-help books. The book says it will guide readers step-by-step step to a life of non-committal inertia. You can choose not to respond. You can choose not to move, it says on the jacket. It offers a wealth of self-help aids on how to eliminate energy and drive including the Sloth Songbook, Sloth Breakfast Bars, packed with sugar, of course, Sloth Documentaries, and a special TV network devoted to Sloth programming, guaranteed not to stimulate or challenge in any way. 
Of course, this book is a joke, but it brings up an important question. Why should we think that sloth or acedia is a vice? What if we choose not to move? As I mentioned at the beginning of this course, virtues are supposed to arise from the demands of human nature. Is there something about ambition or purposeful activity that fulfills our nature? What's wrong with choosing a life of indolence? One kind of answer appears in Herman Melville's short story, Bartleby the Scrivener, which is a very curious tale about a man whose ambition is to do nothing. Bartleby is ambitious to be unambitious. The narrator of the story is a lawyer and Bartleby is his copyist. At first, Bartleby does high quality work. But one day when he is asked to proofread a document, he replies, I would prefer not to. This becomes his standard answer to every request. The lawyer discovers that Bartleby never leaves the office. He says he prefers not to move or act or do anything. Eventually, he's imprisoned and dies of starvation because he prefers not to eat. Bartleby is the extreme, and although his ambition not to do anything is fatal, there is something admirable about someone who has the self-control to die rather than to do anything. In a way, he's more ambitious than most people who are normally active. But I think his case shows something about the relationship between activity and human nature. Aristotle argued that the human end is a life of eudaimonia, which is a life of characteristic human activities under the guidance of reason. If we do not engage in characteristically human activities, we cannot be happy. And if we don't engage in activities at all, we die.